Um, I want to talk about uh, Christmas a little bit, opening the presents, uh, or actually opening the present, the present day. We live in a crazy time, and it's a really good idea to look at the present, be here and now. And I was thinking about Christmas, and I think we all have a magical memory of Christmas, right? A little bit. I remember as a kid, it was always like this anticipation building up. And I remember that, even if it was 30 years ago, I remember some of it, you know? And it's how powerful these memories stay with you. And something that happens year after year, like a, like a holiday, especially Christmas, it creates a sort of set of memories. There's like a chain. Then one year there was my uncle, and then one year there was my cousins. And, then, and so it kind of adds to this story, right? And it stays with you. So I was thinking about the past and being nostalgic. And I was realizing I'm not very nostalgic. Uh, Keisha and I have this thing where she, she wishes me or my family was more into celebrating holidays. I'm not into it at all. I don't really like, keep track. But I'm getting more into it as I grow because it's a chance to make memories. When you really make something special on a special day, it's a chance to have a memory you can take with your whole life. And, you know, I was thinking about this. Common kind of phrase right now is YOLO. You only live once. Seize the moment. People know this, right? You'll see it all the time, Facebook feed. You only live once. Live in the moment. Live like it's your last day. Actually, I have a little rebuttal to this. You don't just live in the moment, even when you try. You can't. Because your memory from the past will affect the moment now. Will it not? So right now, I can make myself happier just by thinking about that one time I, w I had hot cocoa by the fire and it was Christmas time. Wow, my moment right now just got happier because I went into the past. Isn't that interesting? So when people say, just forget the past, uh, that's kind of throwing the baby with the bathwater. The past affects our current moment right now. And guess what? Because of that, emotion and feeling I just made myself happen, have. <laughs> now I'm looking forward to next Christmas. So now I'm in the future too. Whoa, I'm thinking about future happiness. And so that's something brilliant that I think I have to credit uh, Reverend Moon with is that we don't live in the present, we don't live in the past, and we don't live in the future. We live in the past, present, and future all at the same time. It's all three converged. Isn't that interesting? So all three matter. And I was thinking about how most of my life, I think I've spent thinking about future and not really paying attention to things in the present, like crazy musician life, you know? Not doing my laundry on time and just wearing my tuxedo everywhere because it was the only thing clean. And it's amazing how when you're really present, there's a higher chance that that memory uh, will last with you. So they have studies that show that children don't really think far in the past and far in the future, right? Tomorrow is forever. Oh, you can play your video games tomorrow. Wah! Right? It's like, that's forever. That will never happen. That's eternity away. Tomorrow. Forget three weeks or three days or three months. That doesn't exist, right? So it's all about the present. It's even in the handwriting. Um, I studied a handwriting analysis book that said that the the you know, handwriting from like kindergartners is big in the middle, right? Well, they say handwriting analysis, the middle part represents the present. The upper part is the future and other things and lower is other things. The present is the middle. And so I was thinking about that. When I was a kid, I had a dinosaur, red stuffed animal dinosaur, and his name was Dino. I was pretty creative back then, as you could tell. I wasn't creative with the name, though. I mean, I was creative with the spelling. I remember that. I have to tell you about this. I insisted that I, he would spell his name D-E-N-O, even though dinosaur is not spelled with an E. Um, and I remember fighting with my parents and my neighbors. No, his name is Dino, D-E-N-O. Get it right. And my whole world was about waking up and spending time with Dino and his friends, his stuffed animal friends. And I remember this little stuffed animal even now. How crazy is that? Why is my brain using RAM energy and space to think about that? 
and get joy from that. So it's amazing when you're really present and your whole world is about, you're really soaking up what's in front of you, you're actually absorbing it better. You can actually take it with you. So it's good to be as present as we can, as present as we can, because it affects everything. And we want to notice something that I'm teaching myself, so I am not on a high pedestal here, something I'm teaching myself is to notice things. Just notice. Not just the good things, but also the bad things. Not just joy things, but pain too. Because a lot of times our human instinct is to run away from pain, right? Oh, just oh, don't, don't acknowledge it. Don't give it give and take or whatever. But it's actually good to notice because sometimes it's telling you something. Something's off. Something needs to be addressed. And we don't really look at it. <laughs> so I'm looking at, I, I was really uh, studying this guy, Master Ming Tong Gu, recently. And he has an amazing wisdom that I want to share. He said, with pain, we respond differently. And we have this little checklist. First, usually we try to run away. Run away from it, escape, move to another state, or change jobs, or run away. The second thing we do sometimes is we analyze. We tell stories about it. We go, oh, well, when this happened and this happened, and then, well, it actually connected like this, and it was synergetic, and, we, and you create a story out of it, and you can explain why this bad thing happened, this uncomfortable thing happened. Third, sort of the other half of that coin is we complain. We just, it sucks. It's terrible. And the fourth thing we do, there's actually five, but the fourth thing we do is sometimes we just bear it and we wait. You know? Don't do anything. Don't look at it. Like, I don't know, Jurassic Park. If you don't move, he won't see you. <laughs> That's not true for things in, in your an emotional life. <laughs> don't move. It won't see you. You just wait, and you wait, and you wait, and then you die. Some people do that. And I think we all do a little bit of everything. And the fifth thing is we think about it, and we know we've got to fix something. We've got to change something. So we throw a Hail Mary pass at it. We do something out of desperation. And um, Ming Tang Gu was talking about physical things like healing, like if only uh, it's this powerful drug, it's this new drug, it's better than the old drugs. The new drug, once I get this one prescription, it's going to fix everything for the rest of my life. I'll be healed for the rest of my life from this one thing. Even in natural medicine, which I'm more a fan of, this one healer, this one technique fixes everything. Isn't that true that we kind of do that? I think I've done that um, even when praying to God. In the past, I would never pray, ever. It was like between a span of like 10 years, it would be like a couple prayers, right? Or thinking about it. But, but I remember I would pray every now and then. It was when I really needed something. And I would always promise God, okay, I'm going to admit something a little embarrassing, and I want you to admit it too. Get ready. So usually when I, talk, when I had this kind of prayer, I would say, God, if you just give me this one last thing, I'll never ask for anything again, and I'll be good. Right? We pray like that, right? Desperate. Because it gets so bad. It's like, I need this one last thing. I'll tell you, I did that uh, with this one right here. <laughs> when I met her, I liked her. I don't think she was, I think she was scared. <laughs> I was like, God, just convince her. This one last thing. She's the one, I'm pretty sure. Just make it happen. <laughs> make this happen. I'll, I'll always be good. I'll never ask for another thing. It's the last, it's the ultimatum. You know, it's the last thing. And we pray like that sometimes. It's like, I'm going to cash in all the chips right now to get this. I mean, it kind of worked. It was a strong prayer, I guess, right? <laughs> She's still scared sometimes. It's like, oh, my God, what did I do? So the Hail Mary pass, just this one thing. So I'm going to throw all my money at this one thing. And this kind of idea that one thing will affect you and just clean up and make you happy, never-ending happiness, is a false concept. 
It doesn't work like that. We do it for every area. If I got that one job, if I just got the right career, I would have been happy. But man, I'm not happy because I don't have the right career, right? Or the right degree. Man, if I didn't study music history and I studied something useful, I'd be happy, <laughs> right? I've been there. I've been there. It's like, why did I study music? So I've had a lot of doubts, but now I, I've come around, all 360. But that one degree, that one skill, that one job, that one choice, that's going to fix happiness for your rest of your life. Happens in marriage, too. If I just follow the rules and get married, I'm done. Everlasting happiness. I'm, I'm, a, I'm in the finish line. Married people, you know it doesn't work like that, <laughs> right? You get married, everlasting happiness instantaneously uh -uh, does not happen like that. What is it? It's a daily grind every day, right? It's like you're hitting that refresh button over and over and over again. Okay, I'm married. Oh, God, how do I deal with this? I'm married. Oh, how do I deal with this? I'm married. <laughs> it's like it's a refresh constantly, constantly daily for the rest of your life, every single day. There's a great analogy for this. When you learn how to ride a bicycle, you might think, ah, oh, if I only knew how to ride a bicycle, I'd be happy. So you learn how to ride a bicycle and you have to repeat it. You know, there's certain neurological, right? There's pathways in your body and it takes a repetition to get it set, right? So you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, you do it and then you learn how to ride a bicycle. Okay, great. I guess I'm done with that now. I have my neurological pathway. Yay, I'm happy. Wait, it doesn't work like that. You actually have to go back on the bicycle to experience the joy of being on a bicycle. Anytime you want to experience that joy, you got to go back and back and back to experience the experience that you want, the joy. So joy, I, I really feel that if we're going to understand our purpose and we want to try to understand our families and God, we want to understand joy. Joy does not have a, an autopilot that after you've learned this skill, you're joyful forever. Joy is a daily refresh over and over, getting back on the bicycle, back on the bicycle, back on the bicycle, back on the bicycle. It's an interesting analogy. And I think, when I think about the, the religious or the biblical kind of feeling to this, I think about when Jesus said, if you want to follow me, pick up your daily cross. It's a very heavy kind of language, but your daily cross. Wait, I thought you only had to go to cross once. I mean, it's pretty bad, right? Could I just go to once and that's it and go to heaven? Daily cross? Daily cross. <laughs> and we can translate that, you know, into, into kind of, a more unificationist lens, daily refreshing on, on the challenge of loving your family, daily refresh on the challenge of making a relationship work, daily refresh on the struggle to find the next thing in your future or feeling secure about what's coming next. It's a daily thing. It's a daily cross. <laughs> it's a daily thing. An interesting story that I think kind of a window into this you know, Jesus wasn't the only one that walked on water. The famous story, Jesus walked on water. There was a second person that walked on water. Do you know who it is? It's Peter. That's why there's so many Peters in the world. <laughs> <laughs> is he here? No, he's not here. Okay. <laughs> we can still talk about him. Um, there's so many Peters in the world. Peter walked on water. And the story is so Hollywood, it's like so movie-esque. There's a storm, and off in the distance, there's the vision, right? Jesus is out there, and he's standing on the water. And Peter, like I told you a couple of weeks ago, Peter was that guy who blurts out everything they think. They just blurt it out with 100% confidence. I'll die for you. Yes, let's go. That was his personality, and he made a real fool of himself a couple of times. So he said, in the storm, he said, Jesus, Lord, <laughs> Beckon me to come to you on the water, and I will. I mean, this is like Clint Eastwood times a thousand, right? <laughs> and so Jesus says, come. 
That's how it says it in the Bible. Come in red letters, right? Whoa, okay. So he gets up, he gets out of the boat and stands on the water and starts walking towards Jesus on the water with his eye focused on Jesus, step, 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 after one after the other. And he's focused on Jesus and he's on the water. And you know what happens next? His little, pat, little sentence, he put his eye on the raging wind. His eye caught the storm and he sank. So when he was focused, when he was in the present of I am on the water, I'm going to Jesus, the miracles and the power was happening, right? The power happens when you're focused, when you're in the present. And he had that little doubt, that little fear like, oh, maybe I'll drown. So that's kind of a future thing, right? Oh, maybe I'll drown. You know, this wind is pretty bad. Whoa, sank. So he was focused. When he focused on the circumstance, he lost his power. When he was focused on Jesus, he had the power. That's this story. And we do it too. When we're focused on our goal, when we're focused on the present, okay, I have these many bills to pay. I, I am this short of it. I got to grind. I got to do this. When you're focused, you're in a zone. You're in a flow. When you start thinking about the circumstances, when your eyes go to the circumstances, you lose your power. You lose your power. So this is the power of daily focusing in on the refresh. And for us, we can kind of translate this and extrapolate it into focus on your family. Focus on your heart. We all want to grow our heart. That's what following Jesus is about anyway, right? Following and being a, a believer in God. Developing the heart. Focusing on the heart. If you block that out, and you think about circumstance, 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 situation, analysis, story, you're losing your power. You're losing your power. So when we come up to this next Christmas season, I think it's a great way to hit a refresh button and see our families again. See them, really see them. See your spouse again. Don't just be like, oh, yeah, married, been saying, you know, a lot of years, okay. <laughs> See them. Notice. Noticing is very powerful. There could be a memory there that you can make and will last you your whole life. And we want to do this as much as we can daily, 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 daily. And just don't forget to focus, right? So I want um, all of you to spread the word for the Christmas concert, and we want to make our family big. We want to expand. We want to grow. And keep your eye on growing your heart, growing your family, grow your heart. That's our goal this Christmas. I think we're going to do a great job. It's going to be amazing. And uh, thank you very much, guys. <laughs>